Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study on our Facebook page for June 9th, 2021. Tonight we're looking at the city of Jerusalem. I know it seems like an odd Bible study thing to emphasize, but there's a few details that we kind of miss reading and why it's so significant and why it was such a big deal and why people in the, in the monotheistic religions today are still fighting over Jerusalem. And I'm not trying to get into eschatological ex points about Jerusalem. Um, if you need to go back and study how to read apocalyptic literature, you can do that. We, it's all on our Facebook page and much of our YouTube channel. As long as there's electricity, I hear, it'll be there. Having said that, why Jerusalem? One of the things that we really miss about King David, King David the Anointed, King David the Messiah, King David who created the largest expanse of Israel ever, who created the greatest kingdom of Israel ever, King David, a man after God's own heart, is that he was incredibly wise in taking almost an, an impossible situation to manage and working it out. And he did lots of things that maybe we wouldn't have done, but we weren't, aren't living in that time period and maybe different circumstances, and we can go through all of that, different culture. But do you know why Jerusalem is the city of David? I mean, quite frankly, it's a rather obscure Old Testament th thing for many of us who, who are Protestant Christians. We don't really talk about it. Why Jerusalem? Now David will speak because we'll have an actor being David for Eyewitness Bible Study in a moment. But why Jerusalem? Um, if you read, I believe it's 2 Samuel chapter 5, this will be the narrative. I'm going to read from 1 Chronicles 11. If you're not familiar with the following of the books of Samuel and the books of Kings, the book of Chronicles, this analogy breaks down. But think of it this way. Chronicles is kind of like, you know, we have another account of the same events, just from a different perspective, kind of like the reasons we have different Gospels. I mean, that, don't push that analogy too far, but that's the, for our purposes, let's go with that. The writer of the Samuels and the Kings writes from a certain perspective, a certain important divine perspective. The writer of Chronicles is as the name Chronicles lists, is just concerned about, give me the facts, ma'am, just the facts and the numbers and all these things. And there's, there's not often a lot of sugarcoating. So in 2 Samuel, you get some of these details, but I'm going to read the first Chronicles chapter 11 version. So as you should know, or through this study, and if not, I've not done a good job presenting it, David gets anointed as king, but he doesn't become king for a really long time. He has to wait for the previous anointed, the previous Messiah, Saul, to be out of the picture. That takes a while. And then after that, he has to deal with Saul's children. And that takes quite a while. Quite frankly, that takes until at least, for sake of our discussion, if he's, if, you know, he's anointed way back in the middle or the beginning of 1 Samuel, it's it's Second Samuel chapter 4, before this is all completely taken care of. Let me read to you from First Chronicles chapter 11, as it tells the narrative. First one, it says, All Israel came together to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, even while Saul was king, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord your God said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel and you will become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to David at Hebron, he made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over all of Israel, as the Lord had promised through Samuel. Verse 4. David and all the Israelites marched to Jerusalem. That is Jabus. I always have trouble pronouncing that. It's J-E-B-U-S. Jabus. The Jebusites, that's why I have trouble saying it, who lived there said to David, You will not get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, which is the city of David. David had said, has said, Whoever leads the attack on the Jebusites will become commander-in-chief. 
Joab, son of Jeroah, went up first, and so he received the command. Verse 7, David then took up residence in the fortress, and so it was called the city of David. In the Samuel version, we have some taunting by the Jebusites and saying, you know, even our lame and our blind, which in that time culture would have, they were really being derogatory, said we can defend our city. You can't get in here. Our walls are too great. There are a lot of legends that Joab, who was crafty, he did some things that sound like out of a spy movie. And maybe he did that, maybe he didn't. I don't know if, if it happens as often as the Old Testament describes it, I don't know why people didn't know this is the way you capture a walled city. But you take advantage of their water supply and you sneak in and you go from there. This is how it happens. Important detail I want us to get if, if missed in David's dramatic presentation is David needs a new city to create a new kingdom so that things can grow and be what they are called to be. He can't just do things the same old way. He has to create something new. It's, he's got to rebrand his country. He's got to rebrand things. That's why Jerusalem is so important. That's what becomes known as the city of David. And that's why David, who is the ruler when Israel is the largest, is the example in which all messiahs are compared to up to the time of Jesus. This is why all of this is significant. I'm going to turn this over to Eyewitness Bible Study, and then I'll come back just to close our session for this evening. Jerusalem, my city. Have you been there? I call it my city because I once owned it. All of it. Well, it actually belonged to God, and he called it his city too. You cannot truly understand the stories of the kings and prophets unless you know Jerusalem. Once a tiny village on a hillside, Jerusalem grew into one of the most famous cities in the entire world. Even in modern times, it's a focal point of three major religions. Jerusalem, God's beloved city, chosen by him as the location of his temple. Perhaps the first mention of Jerusalem in the Bible is when Abraham met the mysterious priest Melchizedek. At that time, the city was named Salem, as in Jerusalem. Abraham returned from defeating the kings who had kidnapped his nephew Lot, and Melchizedek brought out bread and wine and blessed Abraham. The first communion ceremony. Since Melchizedek was a priest of God, Abraham gave him a tenth of everything second mention of my city was during the conquering of the promised land by Joshua. God commanded the Israelites to conquer the land and destroy the peoples who lived there. Joshua conquered most of the country but was not able to conquer my city. At that time the city was named Jebus. The next important mention of my city is a lesser known passage about my battle with the giant Goliath. After I defeated Goliath and cut off his head, I took it to Jerusalem. And there's no record in the Bible about why I did that or what I did with the head after I got there. Some people believe I placed it on a hill outside of the city because of the hill's name, Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Some of those people think the Gaul part of Golgotha comes from Goliath. Can't you just imagine what it might have looked like for a skinny shepherd boy to plant a spear in the ground and then place a giant's head on it? Can you just imagine how defiantly that young boy might have stared at the magnificent city and hurled insults and threats at it? I can imagine it. Because I grew up only five miles south of Jebus in a small village named Bethlehem. I've loved Jebus ever since I was a kid. It always infuriated me that Jebus had defied Joshua and the Israelites and that it continued to exist independently until my time. The city seemed impenetrable. Steep ravines on three sides, a huge wall to the north. You know what else made me angry? It was my tribe. 
the tribe of Judah that was supposed to have conquered Jebus. Every time I tended my sheep and saw the city lights in the distance, it made me furious. I promised myself that with God's help, I would someday change that forever. The next important passage about Jerusalem explains why it's called the City of David. After the death of King Saul, God said I should move to Hebron, where I controlled the lands of the tribe of Judah. From Hebron, I was at war for several years with King Saul's son, Ishbosheth. After the death of Ishbosheth, I was proclaimed king of all of Israel. Now, this did not mean that the 12 tribes were automatically united and ruled by me. Each tribe had elders that I had to appease while forming a united nation of the 12 tribes. It seemed a good idea to move the capital of the country to a new location and have a new start. I thought about choosing my hometown of Bethlehem, but it didn't have a good enough water supply and wasn't in a good strategic location from either a military or a trade point of view. I knew that Jebus would be a great location to start my new kingship. All I had to do was conquer it. If I could do so with little warfare, I would have a ready-made walled city that was located perfectly to unite the 12 tribes of Israel. <laughs> have you seen those walls? I love that city. My men and I marched straight up to it. We looked at the impenetrable walls and steep hillside. And the people of Jebus stood on the walls and made fun of us. <laughs> they felt so secure with their position. They said even the lame and blind could defend their city. Seemed to me they might be right. In my exasperation, I turned to my men and said, whoever leads a successful attack will become commander in chief of my army. We will not be successful attacking the walls, so come up with another plan. My nephew, Joab, <laughs> he never told me how he got the job done with so little damage to the city, but I've always assumed he did it using some sneaky plan. Joab was crafty and mean. I've heard that he captured a Jebusite shepherd and tortured him into telling him all about the city. He learned that the city was vulnerable through a water shaft, so he and his men climbed up the shaft. Then he opened the city gates, and the rest of my men rushed in to defeat it. It's just a rumor, of course. But he did find a way to get in, and he earned the right to be my commander-in-chief, which he remained until my death. <laughs> At long last, I owned the former city of Jebus. After our victory, I renamed it Jerusalem. It was also known as Zion, or the City of David. The original City of David was only about a dozen acres located on a very steep hill. Steep ravines on the east, south, and west. The north side was its weakest point, as it would continue to be for the rest of the city's history. To the north was a shallow depression which led to Mount Moriah. Maybe you remember Mount Moriah. It was the location where Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac. During my time, it was the location of the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. I bought the land of Arana to build an altar to God. He offered the land and sacrifice materials to me for free. I could not sacrifice anything to God that cost me nothing, and I told him that. After my death, my son Solomon built the temple on that threshing floor. As you can imagine, with the temple located outside of the city gates, the city started growing to the north and the areas surrounding the temple. It also started growing to the northwest on the hill known as Zion. It could not grow very much in the other directions because of the steep ravines. Over the next few hundred years, the city would expand its walls as it grew. Now, eventually, the small hill of the original city of David would be a tiny part of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was located in the land of the tribe of Benjamin, near the border of the tribe of Judah. That is one reason that when Israel later split into two countries, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin stayed together as the southern kingdom. My family members ruled as kings of that southern kingdom until 582 BC, when the Babylonians completely defeated the Israelites and took them into exile. My family had ruled for more than four centuries. 
When the Israelites left Jerusalem in exile, the entire city and its walls fell into disrepair. Now, decades later, the Jews started returning. They rebuilt the city and the temple, but only as a shadow of its former self. My beloved city. Many of the people cried when they remembered Jerusalem and the temple in the glory years. So that's the geography and political importance of Jerusalem. But I have not adequately explained why Jerusalem was not an ordinary capital of a country. The story starts more than 400 years before my time, with Moses and the Israelites in the wilderness. While in the wilderness, the Israelites built the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the place that functioned as God's home on earth. He lived in the area of the Holy of Holies that housed the Ark of the Covenant. Imagine that. The God of the universe living in a tent amongst a bunch of wandering Jews. When Joshua and the Israelites conquered Israel, the tabernacle and Ark of the Covenant were left in the town of Shiloh. Although the priests continued to sacrifice in Shiloh, it does not appear that God still lived in the tabernacle. It was just an empty tent with a bunch of golden artifacts. A few decades before I became king, the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant but returned it to a new location. After I became king, I took 30,000 able young men of Israel to bring the Ark to the city of David. The entire country celebrated with me as the Ark was moved under the direction of God's priests. The oxen stumbled, the Ark slipped. Uzzah instinctively reached out to steady it and was struck dead by God because of his irreverence in touching it. I... I was so scared that we took the Ark to the nearby house of Obed-Edom. After three months, I dared to try to move the Ark again and took extraordinary pains to do it reverently. Whenever those carrying the Ark had walked six steps, I sacrificed a bull and fattened calf. I was thrilled. I, I danced before the Lord with all my might. I couldn't contain myself. When we reached the city of David, I placed the Ark of the Covenant in a special tent, and there it remained for many years. When Israel eventually gained peace, Nathan the prophet gave me permission to build the temple, a, a, a building dedicated to the worship of God. However, God rescinded that permission and promised me that my descendant would build the temple. I was devastated, but I completely understood. So, I started gathering the materials that my son would need. Toward the end of my life, I gave Solomon detailed instructions about ruling the country, including building the temple, and I provided most of the materials he would need. It took him seven years to build it. After it was built, he furnished it and placed my dedications in it. In an amazing ceremony, Solomon moved the Ark of the Covenant from the city of David and to the temple. In the ceremony, they sacrificed so many sheep and cattle that they could not be counted. The priests placed the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies of the temple. And there was nothing in the Ark at that time except the two stone tablets that Moses had placed in it. The manna and staff of Aaron that Moses had put in it no longer existed. When the priests withdrew from the Holy of Holies, a cloud filled the temple. God had come to live with his people again. Jerusalem became God's city. Jerusalem and the temple became the focus of life for the Israelites. That day was the highlight of the Jews, the chosen people of God. God had fulfilled his covenant with Abraham by giving us the land of Israel. He was our God and we were his people. We built him a temple and he lived with us. That day was the day that we had all longed for. Jerusalem 
was the home of God. Nothing could be more precious than that. However, the stories of all the kings and prophets is the shameful record of the Israelites refusing to consistently worship and serve God and the penalties they paid for being unfaithful. Jerusalem was where their faithfulness or unfaithfulness was often demonstrated. It is no wonder that my city, Jerusalem, the city of God, became the city where God once lived. Hopefully you enjoyed hearing from David and Jerusalem and all those things. I just want to conclude with a couple application questions uh, that I've slightly modified that actually come from the Eyewitness Bible Study group. David, clearly as a young man, we'll call him a teenager for sake of discussion, lived in the distance and could see the town of Jabez. He knew its history and apparently this is the scene, this is around the area in which he kills Goliath. It appears he had lots of dreams of, when I'm king someday, because remember he had a long time to plan this, because he had a long time to plan. When I'm king someday, that's going to be where my kingdom is. Because that will centralize the tribes, it has significance to me, maybe it will be something remembered forever. He had time to plan. The biblical writers, especially the writers of Chronicles, want us to see that when you have time to plan, you should use it wisely. What are we doing to work towards our dreams to accomplish them wisely? Second, and this is, I will read it verbatim for my witness Bible study. This is targeted towards teenagers, but I think it applies to all of us. What would Jesus think about the contention of Jews, Christians, and Muslims over the city of Israel today, the city of Jerusalem today? If you had soul power, what would you do about who controls the Temple Mount and Jerusalem today? How would you solve this? I think that's going to be tricky, huh? And I think that reflects upon your personality, and I think I would flip the question to, if Jesus could instill in all of us what exactly should happen for the city of Jerusalem, what would that be? Would it involve fighting? Would it involve peace? Before you assume it would mean peace, how did David take the city of Salem, the city of Jebus, the city known as Jerusalem, how did he take it? By force. It's always been an area of violence and force, and I don't want to read too much in, and I don't want to feed into pop eschatology. But you cannot argue that the city has always had a violent past. Is that what God wants? Or is that just us forcing our ways? And maybe it was okay for David. These are tr hard questions I'm just going to leave you with in this Bible study. Maybe it was okay for David to use violence based on the culture he lived in and what God was trying to accomplish. But if we live under a new covenant in which the rules are different, how are we supposed to convey God's power? And how do we do that? Now, if you buy into, and they're plausible and they're defendable, into much of what I refer to as pop eschatology of God's going to turn about the city of Israel, Temple Mount, all these things that have to happen, then you might lean towards violence. And why don't we get the violence started so we can get this over with? I would suggest, though I'm reading way too much into it, that I would go with the tradition that this is what Judas tried to do. Judas tried to speed up the process so the violence could happen and betrayed Jesus. 
These are some tough questions to ponder how we deal with this and how we solve these things. But what we do know is the city of Jerusalem, what we know is the city of Jerusalem, meant great things to David, and he had planned for a long time to do that. I wonder what he would be thinking about the city of Jerusalem today. Thanks for being a part of this. Sorry, you know, the logical conclusion with this kind of study is not emotionally satisfying. But this is the world we live in. And if the city of Jerusalem still has significance, well, what you think that significance is, it sure seems like a place in which we're fighting and fighting and fighting. And that's just the real world. And it doesn't just go away because you want to make it better. It requires us to let God do God's part and us to do our part and figure out what our part is to solve the brokenness in the world. Let me close in prayer. Gracious God, thank you that we have the example of David. We have the city of Jerusalem and many of those things that are happened that that our 21st century Christian sensibilities do not appreciate. But just because we don't appreciate them doesn't take away from the fact that they were true and they happened. Thank you for real people with real faith trying to live that out. And thank you for the fact that they do mess up and so I can feel better that I mess up. But help me to learn from them. And we look at a world in which there is fighting and fighting and fighting. Help me to be an agent of peace as I live out the new covenant. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week.